I have a question for you. Should human beings seek angelic encounters, initiating conversations with those heavenly beings? Of course, many New Agers teach and promote this, but lately, especially, some Christian teachers have insisted that we can and should. Is this pure biblical truth? Or is it an aspect of New Age spirituality? We need to discover. My first response is this. Why would we even want to or need to? We have access into the very throne room of God. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16 says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. If you can go to the King of kings and Lord of lords with your petition, why would it be attractive to you to try and connect relationally with angels? It would be like having an invitation to go to the White House and meet the president in the Oval Office, and you travel all the way to Washington, D.C., and then get hung up in a conversation with a guard at the entrance and miss your appointment with the president, which would have been more valuable. So I, I think really the emphasis should be communicating with God. And if he chooses to send an angel to communicate a message to us, let it be. That's wonderful, but certainly not something I'm passionate about. And not something I'm trying to make happen. I acknowledge that angels have an important role in our redemption, in what God is doing in our life. But I'm not in charge of them. I talked about that in the last episode, that we are not given authority to command angels. So why try to open up a line of communication with them, initiating it on our side? It is true that God uses angels to direct us, to protect us, to bring messages from heaven to us, to somehow defend us from our adversaries. There's plenty of scripture to prove those points. In Hebrews chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, God talks about how he made those ministering spirits to minister to the heirs of salvation. And so he created them with the nature to minister and for the role of ministering to those who would inherit salvation. Now, strangely, angels were created before human beings, apparently. And yet God, in anticipation of the fall of humanity, created them with the capacity of helping the fallen ones be restored. So that was God making a way before the way even needed to be made. What an amazing aspect of God. Then everyone loves Psalm 91. And the verse that says, God gives his angels charge over us. It didn't say it gives us charge over them. It said he gives his angels charge over us to bear us up in their hands, lest we dash our foot against a stone. How powerful is that? And of course, in 2 Kings chapter 6, the army of soldiers, Syrian soldiers, is coming up through the valley to uh, get hold uh, of Elisha because he's been hindering what the king of Assyria wanted. Uh, the king of Syria wanted to do, and uh, the servant was quite nervous. And so Elisha prayed and said, "God opened his eyes, and he saw angels everywhere, and chariots of fire on the mountainside." And Elisha made the most powerful statement. He said, they that are with us are more than they that be with them. So apparently there were demonic hordes with the Syrian army, but angelic armies with the prophet of God. One prophet, one servant with him, and an army of angels. But God is referred to as the Lord of hosts, which is a title that means the God of an army of angels that are poised and ready for battle. And he is the commanding general. He is the one that activates them on the battlefield. I'm not the one deciding where they should fight and what they should do. The creator, though, has intentionally 
made angels miraculously and amazingly capable of shuttling back and forth between the spiritual world and the natural world, the heavenly realm and the earthly realm. They have that amazing capability, even though they are usually invisible to us. However, sometimes they are seen. In fact, Jesus told Nathaniel, after he recognized that he was the son of God, he said, you'll see greater things. You'll see angels ascending and descending upon the son of man. Well, that had kind of a double meaning. Because, yes, it meant that there would be great angelic activity around Jesus wherever he went. Why would that be necessary? Again, this world is in warfare, and angels are very involved in spiritual warfare. And Jesus made a huge advance for the kingdom of God everywhere he went. And there's demonic opposition to the advance of the kingdom of God. But there was also a subtle reference, too, because it goes all the way back to Genesis, where Jacob had his famous dream where he saw a ladder extending from earth to heaven and angels of God ascending and descending on that ladder. So he assumed that spot was the gate of heaven. That spot was some kind of portal into the supernatural world. Well, it wasn't so much that spot that Jacob called Bethel. It was the fact that he was chosen of God to be part of a plan of redemption that would ultimately bring the kingdom of God fully into this world. And when Jesus said angels would ascend and descend on him, maybe it was his way of implying that he was Jacob's ladder that Jacob's ladder was only a symbol prophetically of something even better to come through Jacob's seed. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were the patriarchs of Israel, and then from Israel, from the tribe of Judah, came forth the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's the true ladder, the connection, the door to the eternal realm. And wherever you find Jesus, you find angelic activity. And so if Jesus is in your heart and life, then there should be angels ascending and descending over your life. Jacob didn't try and initiate a conversation with them, and neither should we. If God chooses for them to speak to us, that's all right, but it's not a choice we should make. Now, I don't deny that angels are an important part of our journey through this world, but I have serious reservations about New Age beliefs mingling with Christian doctrine. You can find many, many New Age websites that promote the idea of communicating with angels and many New Age teachers that focus on that area. And I, I went to one New Age website in researching this that said three of the main ways you communicate with angels are, number one, automatic writing where you just sit down and start writing whatever thoughts are funneled through you, and it doesn't distinguish what kind of spirit you may be picking up. In fact, it doesn't even differentiate between evil spirits and angelic spirits. Just start writing as you feel the supernatural influence, and don't question what you write. Just go ahead and let it flow, and that way your angel can talk through you. Well, inevitably, if someone does that, they're going to come in contact with the spirit God, which is a demonic spirit impersonating the role of a good influence or a good spirit that would bring good things in a person's life. The second way is initiating conversations with angels just by asking, speaking into the air and asking those angels to manifest themselves in some way. And the third way New Agers teach to communicate with angels is to look for signs, to pay attention to unique sounds or pay attention to unique smells or tastes, because those are signs sometimes of an angelic presence trying to make itself known. Or things like random feathers being seen here and there as a sign that an angel is close by trying to communicate with us. Well, New Agers are not the only ones that uh, get involved in these kind of things. I've read instructions by Christians who support the idea of angel communication also, and they take a unique slant on a certain biblical passage, Titus 1, verse 15, that says, To the pure, all things are pure. 
And so apparently if you're a born again, blood washed Christian, you can involve yourself in some of these kind of practices, but it purifies it because you're in a right connection with God. Well, I don't believe Christians are called to redeem false spiritual practices and somehow incorporate them into a biblical worldview, even though we have no biblical basis for doing so. For instance, would I encourage people to do yoga and meditate on those energy centers called chakras? Just uh, be sure to quote the Lord's Prayer while you do it so that you sanctify the process. I shudder at the thought of doing that. When I left yoga and meditation 50 years ago, I never looked back. I never turned back to those practices. Would I encourage people to use angel cards, which are similar to the evil and demonic and dark things called tarot cards in order to get communications from the angelic world? Absolutely not. You don't receive angelic communication through a card deck. That's witchcraft. That's divination, something that God is very strongly pitted against. In Deuteronomy especially, you read God's exhortation for his people to be perfect, and he precedes it with the statement they should never be involved in divination. It's a pagan practice. Would I attend a seance and try to contact some dead relatives and justify my behavior by saying, well, Titus 1.15 says to the pure, all things are pure, and so that will purify this process of contacting the dead. A thousand times, no, because... Necromancy is outlawed in Scripture. Was God outlawing that practice of contacting the dead because he wanted to withhold a legitimate experience of the supernatural from us? Absolutely not. He was trying to protect us from demonic deception, not just enforcing rules, getting us under his thumb, but building a wall of protection around us by only advocating in the Bible supernatural access through proper means or proper biblical practices. Some charismatics that are really into angelology ask this question, where does God say not to initiate angelic encounters? And supposedly they assume, they deduce that if God is silent on this issue, no argument can be offered against it. But I would dare to say that God is silent on the issue of uh, initiating angelic encounters. There's absolutely no record in the Bible where God either commands us to do it or it actually took place where a biblical figure, a historical person in the Bible, initiated an angelic encounter. Now, I know there are some who differ with me and some uh, are people who I know are genuine lovers of God, and they love truth, they love the Bible, they want the real, they want the supernatural, they're not cessationists, they don't believe all the supernatural stuff is to be discarded. So many of them really have a passion for God and a passion for the truth, but they would dare to insist that because there's no biblical record that says we shouldn't do it, then we can and often uh, certain comparisons are made. Like this one that I read one time, that the word pastor, and this is what I read, that the word pastor only appears one time in the Bible. Well, that's not exactly correct. In the King James Version, it appears eight times in the Old Testament in the book of Jeremiah, but only one time in the New Testament, which is kind of interesting. It's only found in Ephesians 4, where the Bible talks about Jesus ascending on high and receiving gifts for men, and he gave apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers for the edifying of the body of Christ. And that's the only place where you find the word pastors. However, the Greek word that is translated pastors is poimen. That's P-O-I-M-E-N. Poimen is how it's pronounced. And that word Though it's only found as pastors one time, it's translated into the word shepherd or shepherds 
numerous times in Scripture. In fact, the shepherds that were in the fields watching their flocks the night the angel appeared and said, Unto you is born in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Those shepherds were indicated by this Greek word, poimen, which is translated pastors, because a pastor is a shepherd. In fact, when Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, the word was poimen. He could have easily said, I'm a good pastor, because a good pastor is someone who shepherds his flock, who is in touch with his people, who watches over the details of their lives. And so good shepherds, good pastors are one and the same. But the point was made that I heard voiced that because the word pastor only appears one time in the New Testament and the word angel appears 365 times in the Bible, we are not told to communicate with pastors in Scripture and we're not told to communicate with angels necessarily in Scripture. So if we shouldn't communicate with angels, we shouldn't communicate with pastors because there's no biblical basis for it. Well, I, I think that's kind of a illogical point and certainly a mute point because pastors are human beings, or at least they're supposed to be human beings. Sometimes I think we feel like machines just uh, working through the problems and battles that the people face and, and being there day and night to do so. But pastors are human beings. Angels are spirit beings. So there's a different set of rules to go by. You don't communicate with spiritual beings like you communicate with earthly dwellers, if you want to call them that. There's no problem with reaching out and talking to someone who is a fellow human being, but there's a barrier between heaven and earth that God has placed there. Isaiah called it a covering cast over all people and a veil that is spread over all nations. There's a barrier between the supernatural world and the natural world. And that barrier cannot be crossed unless God chooses for that to take place. You can't just jump into a conversation with some of the cherubim around the throne of God. I know the Bible says we're seated with Christ in heavenly places, and that's all uh, kind of a symbolic position of our ascendancy, not a literal position. Yes, I feel the presence of God right now. Yes, I'm in the kingdom of heaven right now. I'm aware of the kingdom presence around me. So I am seated in a position of authority and power, seated with Christ in heavenly places. But that doesn't mean I can turn around and start talking to one of the 24 elders and expect that person to talk back. No, there's a barrier there, and to transgress that barrier is going to bring us into deception. Some Christians that embrace this extreme form of angelology bring out a point that I think is kind of a valid point, but I have an explanation for it, that God does tell us in his word to resist the devil and to cast out demons. And these are direct scriptural commands to speak with angels, albeit they are angels in a fallen state. Because Satan and his demonic underlings are referred to in scripture as fallen angels. Read Revelation 12. That makes deliverance, therefore, an angel-focused ministry. That's the assumption. And the question some would ask is, why should we focus exclusively on fallen angels communicating with them, casting devils out, resisting the devil, and not focus on the faithful angels? Shouldn't we give at least as much attention to the faithful ones as the fallen ones? Well, that sounds like a real logical point and a good point. However, even though we are commanded to cast out devils, and usually that involves communication with the spirits, maybe not interaction in communication. Sometimes that happens. I've had it happen in a, a service where I was casting a demon out of a person, and, and more than once I've seen it happen. Still, we are not commanded to initiate conversation with angels. That only happens at the will of God. Demons invade people's lives at their will. So they're transgressors and trespassers. 
And God wants us as his representatives to engage with those demons and take authority over them and put them in their place. However, angels only function at the will of God. Demons are in rebellion against the will of God. So there's a different set of rules. And we are not given authority over angels because they're submitted to the higher authority. Hmm. Psalm 103 verse 20 says, Bless the Lord, you his angels who excel in strength and who do his word, heeding the voice of his word. And so... If an angel communicates a message to us, and malach, the Hebrew word translated angel, and angelos, the Greek word translated angel, are also both translated messenger. So often they bring messages to us. But again, that doesn't happen because we use some type of mystical approach that opens up the spiritual realm to us so that we can have these angelic encounters at our will. I've seen statements uh, posted that insist that the biblical pattern, especially in the Old Testament, was that those who received angelic visitations initiated the conversation. And I could give you a few examples, like Abraham and Lot and Zechariah and Daniel and John the Revelator. But in every case, if you'll really read the passages closely, in every case even though those persons made the first statement in the encounter that they received. They were the ones who began the conversation with the angel. However, they were not the ones who started the supernatural event. They were either unexpected interruptions in their lives where some kind of supernatural intervention suddenly took place or an angel communication suddenly took place in a bona fide vision from God, either a waking vision or a night vision, which is a dream from God. So again, no one was doing some kind of esoteric practice to position themselves in a receptive mode to communicate with an angel where they just speak into the spiritual realm and suddenly a portal opens and an angelic appearance takes place. No, in every one of the cases that I could mention, it was God who started the process, not human beings. I'll give you a few examples, but I'm not going to spend too much time. I need to bring this to a close. Read Abraham's encounter with the angel in Genesis 18 verses 1 through 4, and you'll find that it starts out saying the Lord appeared to him by the terebinth trees of Mamre as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. He's just hanging out in his tent door and all of a sudden three men are walking toward him or the appearance of what looks like three men. He is uh, immediately aware there's an unveiling that takes place spiritually for him that these are not ordinary men. And so he lifts up his eyes, beholds these men and he ran from the tent door to meet them, bowed himself to the ground and said, My Lord, if I have now found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. So yes, he was the first one to talk, but his words did not make the experience happen. And then God began to communicate to him what was going to happen to Sodom and and intercession went up from Abraham concerning Sodom, and you can read the whole story. And then the two angels that apparently accompanied the Lord in a bodily form in that visitation to Abraham then went to Sodom to rescue Lot. And you can read about that in Genesis 19. And once again, Lot was the first one to do the talking, but he wasn't the one that planned the trip. He didn't do something to make those angels come to that wicked city. Read it. Genesis 19, verses 1, 2, and 3. Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. Once again, he's just hanging out at the gate of the city. He's not involved in some kind of prayerful mode that we know of. And when Lot saw them, he rose to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face to the ground, and he said, oh, my lords, here now, my lords, please turn into your servant's house and spend the night. So he's extending hospitality to them. 
and he finally insisted strongly enough where they spent the night in his home. And you know the rest of the story, how he was rescued from the fiery conflagration that consumed that city. But again, it was God's decision, not Lot's decision, for that communication to take place. Then you can read many encounters in Daniel and Zechariah where in a visionary state, they may have had this view of an angel and they started the conversation, but it was God who started the vision. It was not a vision that resulted from something they did. And one example is Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 through 18, where Daniel had a vision of one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, and all peoples and nations and languages shall serve him. And then uh, in verse 15, it said, Daniel was grieved in his spirit within his body, and the visions of his head troubled him. And then he came near to one who stood by and asked him the truth of this. And that angelic individual, that entity, began to explain some of what he had just seen in the vision. So, yes, Daniel was the first one to talk in that exchange of conversation, but he was involved in a vision where he saw the Ancient of Days. It wasn't something self-initiated. Over and over again, I can prove that point, but I think I've said enough. One point that I have encountered in all of these angelological ideas is something called godly imagination. And I'm going to end with this, but I believe it's important that I include it because I, I heard this line of logic offered that in Revelation chapter 3, John was shown a door in heaven by Jesus. And at that point in chapter 3 of the book of Revelation, the vision ends after he sees this door. And John is no longer in the spirit. And in order to get in the spirit and begin having another supernatural vision, he uses his previous vision as a stepping stone. And then in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, John decides to picture a door using his quote-unquote godly imagination. He's not in the spirit, and this is not a vision according to that particular viewpoint. Then after he primes the pump by imagining a door, then God takes over, and in verse 2, we find out that he's once again in the Spirit. And in verse 2, his godly, his godly imagination is transformed into a supernatural vision, and he's ushered into the throne room of God. You go read Revelation chapter 3 and chapter 4 and see if you get that. Because there's no break. In the original scripture, there were no chapters and verses anyway. There was no dividing barrier between chapter 4 three and chapter four, there were no chapters. That happened much later on as a means of trying to help uh, the study of the Word of God. So the way we prime the pump spiritually is to imagine something supernatural or angelic because it's proposed that then that ushered John into encounters with angels throughout the rest of the vision in the book of Revelation. And then the Imaginary, therefore, blends into supernaturally real things. I don't accept that. In fact, I strongly oppose that. Practices like that are setting people up for deception. I was involved in a charismatic group in the very beginning of my walk with God 50 years ago that was very much into, quote-unquote, seeing in the Spirit. We would have five-hour prayer meetings every night. And during those prayer meetings, often we would ask each other if we... We're seeing anything in the spirit realm uh, as we sought God, as we passionately prayed. And now I can look back in retrospect and, and without a doubt say much of what we said we saw was really created by human imagination. And we may have tagged, thus saith the Lord, to it, but I would dare to say maybe 90% or more was not really under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We were sincere. We loved God. We passionately prayed seven nights a week, but we were also misled because we were pushing too hard, so thirsty for the supernatural, so thirsty for the real experience of God that we manufactured it ourselves. 
I urge you not to do that. So to sum it up, let me ask two questions. Can we communicate with angels? Oh, yes, we can. In the last episode, I told you about how my wife had an encounter with an angel in a physical form and communicated with that angel. And there are times when people have visionary experiences of angels and communicate with them. I know I have. And so, yes, communication is possible. But my second question, can we and should we initiate conversations with angels? Absolutely not. There is nothing biblically to prove to me that that is acceptable. I want truth. I'm very hungry, very thirsty for spiritual and supernatural reality. And I know you are too, or you would not be listening to this podcast. But let's go after truth more than we go after experience. Amen? I believe you'll agree with me.